will work. Now, we've got a, a youth population which is not accustomed to real work. Well, there wasn't the jobs available to, to get it. We destroyed the auto industry. The apprentice program that went with that is gone. All our high-tech industries are virtually shot, shattered. We have nothing. And we've got to build it back again. Therefore, we have to take a number of things that we can do which will recreate the kind of industrial agricultural potential which we formerly had, which we've lost. And we find that it, this, we are in the same situation in that respect that you find Russia, the largest na nation and area in the world, and some very important features, and China and India and other countries, where they have a very large part of the population which is extremely poor and unskilled. Now, therefore, if we're going to have a future for humanity, we have to solve that problem. And we have to do it in our own country as part of that. We are going to, we have a shortage of development of sources of certain essential raw materials. We're going to have to build a system of cooperation to solve that problem. Russia, for example, in the north of Russia, in Siberia, has, is, has one of those areas of the world where there's a great concentration of mineral wealth. But it's a tundra area. It's an Arctic area, like northern Canada, which is a similar kind of area, like Alaska. You can't just go up there as they do in Africa and just steal the raw materials and walk away with it and put it on a boat and ship it someplace else. No, you have to develop the area. You have to develop the production, which means you have to put people there. You have to build residences there under those kinds of conditions. We can do that. We have to build the industries which will not only extract raw materials which are needed, but which will de develop them into a semi-finished product for application. We therefore have to take the nations, areas of the world, we have dense populations where there's inadequate development. We're going to have to produce the raw materials development program which will solve the problem for them. So this kind of cooperation among nations which means long-term capital investment. We're talking about 50-year, 100-year kinds of investment. This is what we need. And this, in three or four generations, we can change this planet to reach certain objectives which are within our reach under those conditions. So we can unite the world on the basis of we are going to have a division of labor among respectively sovereign nation states. And how are we going to do it? Well, we're not going to have a monetary system. Monetary systems have to be canceled. And you do that by canceling all the worthless debt around. You put the, like you go into a bank. You go into a bank and it's Glass-Steagall. You find there are a lot of bad assets in that bank, a lot of bad obligations. And you have the auditors come in for reorganization under Glass-Steagall or similar law, the way Roosevelt did in the original Glass-Steagall operation. And you say, that crap, forget it, it's gone. Get rid of the monetary system. Take the IMF and everything resembling it and bury it. Take the city of London and bury it. Get rid of it. We're thinking ahead. We're not thinking about what we're going to get tomorrow. We're thinking about what our people are going to have two or three generations ahead. And we're thinking about the, the purpose in life which we're giving to young people today who are coming out of adolescence. The purpose in life for them. When they, when they ask themselves, to what purpose am I living? Am I living to my satisfaction? Am I an animal? Or am I living for the sake of my coming generations? Am I living to, for the joy of my old age? Am I living to do the things that will give me joy in my old age? They will take a grandfather will tell his child, his, child, his, his grandson, I help build that, and here's what you're going to do in your time. It's that force of imagination. When that becomes the policy of nations, to develop the, the imagination in this way, the scientific imagination, the cultural imagination, where do we want to go? What do we want to promise to our grandchildren and their grandchildren? What do we expect as goals that we think we can realize in this term of life? How do we have to educate our people? What do we have to do now? 
to give a meaning to life. Not a sense, I mean, are we animals? Do we just eat and have pleasure from one moment to the other? Or are, are we people who are thinking about humanity, about future generations? Are thinking about what we owe to past generations and what we owe to future generations? Do our lives have meaning? Do they have purpose? Or are we just simply sell, you know, silly pleasure seekers or something, entertainment seekers? And the problem we have today is a cultural problem, which is a moral problem, is that under a zero growth society, a zero technological growth society, a greeny society, mankind becomes less than an animal in moral value. That's why we have this health care program, program. What's the health care policy we're getting in Europe? What's the health care policy now in the United States under the Obama administration? Kill people. Reduce the number of people by cutting down the means of life. They're too young, too many babies. They should die. They're too old. We don't want them. They should die. We don't want jobs which require skills, which means we'll be able to produce less. More people should die. The goal of Prince Philip is described in the sept is to reduce a population of the world from 6.7 billion to two or less. Maximum of two. The official policy of the British monarchy is to reduce the world's population from a 6.7 level today of billions to less than two. That's his policy. That's what the Greenies all about. That's what the Copenhagen thing is all about. Mass murder. So we, we mobilize in that direction. The United States, China, Russia, India. That's the center. That's your baseline. That is sufficient to do this, because if you have those nations united, we can push it through. We can push it through now. Not two years from now, not after the next election next year, but now. Because we are now in a breakdown crisis of the entire international financial monetary system. As I said, back in July, 25th of July of 2007, I said the system is crashing. It's now it crashed. It's finished. Its collapse will be a process ongoing, but it's collapsing. And therefore, we need an immediate treaty agreement among the United States, Russia, China, and India, and other countries which are relevant in that area. First, right? we, we have to do what was done in a limited way in the, in the agreement between China and Russia recently, most recently, in October. Because that's the beginning. That's the pattern. I represent one of the old fossils who are still running around functioning, who represents this tradition, which was once known as the Franklin Roosevelt tradition and even earlier generations. But my, my view is this. Right now, right now, the entire world financial monetary system is collapsing right now. It's not going to collapse. It is now collapsing. It has a date where it collapsed. It collapsed on the day that the little queen of England, in her capacity as emperor of the world, which she described herself as being, virtually, she said, we, we represent one third of the world, you know. And, and uh, we are going to reach out further. We're going to run the world from places such as Dubai, no doubt. Now, Dubai is what? When, when China assimilated Hong Kong, the tradition of Hong Kong under the British Raj uh, went by. And what did the British do? They picked Dubai. Goodbye, Hong Kong, Dubai, we come. Dubai is the center, of, the worst, filthiest center of corruption on this planet. For example, in, in places like nearby countries, if you want to have a crooked constant, uh, transaction, you go to Dubai. They talk about a certain amount of money. Well, what does Dubai essentially? What was Hong Kong? How did Hong Kong exist? Why did it come into existence? Drugs. 
What's Dubai represent? Drugs. Where are the drugs? Well, all over the place, if you want to ask for them the right way. But the drugs come from Afghanistan. They come from a southern part of Afghanistan. Oh, aren't we fighting a war over there somewhere? Uh, uh, to the southern part of Afghanistan, which is occupied by the British military. <laughs> 